Hello and welcome. Uh, this week on We The People, we are focusing on the extremely problematic manner in which some Indian men resort to abuse to try and shut down women with contrarian and independent opinions. Now, many Indian women face this kind of, of abuse every day. But this week, the trolling, the abuse, the hate on social media directed especially towards women has displayed the worst in us for the world to see. Hours after the pop singer Rihanna's tweet to her 101 million followers linked to a news story about the internet blockade at the farmers' protest sites, teenage climate activist Greta Thunberg and the US Vice President's niece, Amina Harris, a lawyer and author in her own right, also tweeted support for the farmers. Their widely shared tweets went viral, garnering thousands of responses and then the floodgates opened. While many have criticized the singer for wading into these uh, protests uh, against laws that have been defended by the Indian government, these internationally renowned women, from a teenager to a UK MP Claudia Webb, to a New York Times bestseller Amina Harris, to journalists, they've all tweeted about the level of hate and misogynistic abuse that they're getting from the Indian subcontinent. Are we normalizing attacking women with opinions with hateful remarks? That's what we're asking on our show. And we have uh, on our show, of course, back today uh, is our audience. We have the people back on We The People. Thank you for all for joining us this Sunday night. But first on the show, I want to go across to Kerala, where joining us is Rajini Chandi. She's an actor. Rajini, thank you so much for your time. You know, you've been trolled for a photo shoot where you were wearing jeans, uh, dresses, all deemed inappropriate by some netizens, deemed inappropriate for a woman basically uh, of your age, you're in your 60s. What happened in this photo shoot, Rajni? Did you like it, Sarah? First you tell me that. I thought you looked fabulous. I thought you looked really good, very strong, okay. very fit, and um, you were admirable. Thank you. See, the thing is, even though I am 16, I am, I am still young at heart. That is the problem. <laughs> that many people can't uh, digest. That many people can't digest. I laugh loudly. I walk so in speed, drive the car fast. And uh, people can always see me with a smiling face. So for a person at the age of 70, it is not expected from a person from a person at the age of 70. That is what I feel. So that is one thing that might have made some people envy or curious or little jealousy. But I, I'm a person, I don't bother about it. But for a Malayali person, I think it is difficult to understand or difficult to digest with it. And uh, maybe because I was living in Bombay for 2021 20, years, my mindset may be little different than from Kerala. Well, it's not just uh, Malayalis. Clearly, we've seen this week. I'm a Malayali myself. Uh, we've seen Greta Thunberg. We've seen Meena Harris. All of them face this. Clearly, uh, uh, Ms. Chandi, these were attempts to censor you to box you, to basically put you in a box to try and make you conform to societal expectations of how, uh, you know, amachis, as we say in, in Malayalam, or grandmothers are to dress and behave. Yeah, actually, I am very sad, actually, very, very sad, because I did this just for fun. Somebody challenged me, can you do it? I said, why not? I have done this dress, I have worn these dresses before, so it is not a big problem for me. Okay, I am bad person, I agree. But they have no right to call my husband or my family uh, with all those things. And uh, I am very attached to my husband. And when I see bad words against him, that I couldn't accept it. Correct. Even now, even now after the photo shoot, uh, they were attacking him actually. They were attacking him and it was really sad. So what exactly do these trolls, what did they say to you? They said, they, they said that uh, your visa hasn't come yet. Then they asked me, in, uh, why can't you sit and read some Bible? And uh, <laughs> That's an original one. 
and some and you know there is a malayalam word you know they don't even know how to address a, a elderly lady like you know they were calling me there is a very uh, what do you call disrespect word called tala tala means oh. old lady you know oh. tala everywhere they are addressing that <laughs> because all these young 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 generation where they are going to be if their mindset is so active and if their mindset is with uh, no so much uh, uh, grudge or you know uh, anger against somebody who they don't know anything about they have not seen me they don't know anything about what type of a person i am Uh, whether I, but just because i walk straight they think that i am an arrogant person well you're a grandma with gumption clearly but uh, rajni how did this affect you did you take down any of these images in any manner do you regret uh, what you did i don't regret i don't regret at all because it is my life I am enjoying my life. Why should they bother? They are not feeding me. They don't take care of me, and my husband take care of me. He doesn't have any problem. My daughter loves it, so it's not. I don't regret at all. But in family also, I have. I'm getting little uh, objection, but then that I I think I can understand. Many people are angry with me because I think what they can't do, I am doing. true um interestingly but in your case uh, you say that in uh, many of the trolls were actually women it's uh, mostly by mostly by women and that also youngsters i think they have lot of restrictions at their home they want to do so many things which they can't do it maybe the husband is objecting or the family is objecting so they want to take it out on somebody who is doing that's all i feel and you know it's okay they can say that i didn't like it what you did fine but why should they call me all the bad names because i am i am nobody for them they have no right to call me all those bad words do do they no and uh, nobody has given the right to say you should do this you should do that you should not do you should not do that much because we didn't like it who say so the government say so so why the why uh, why they are not protecting people like us when we did something like this when somebody is harassing us like this why there is no uh, what do you call protest against that or protection in whether it is in the media or wherever especially when it's i didn't dye my hair i didn't say i am men i never said i am men no i didn't my hair is just like that i am as i am and i am enjoying as i am nobody has the right to criticize me Rajni Chandi, you're an inspiration, a being who you are, and nothing's going to change you. Thank you for joining us, but you've given us a glimpse of uh, what uh, what it's like, what life is like uh, for the average woman in India, and this is just a disturbing snapshot of their lived experience. And there's a lot of conversation about online trolling, but what about when it spills over into the offline world? Let's bring in Neha Dikshit joins us now. She's an award-winning journalist. She's an author. She's a freelance reporter who focuses on investigative journalism, covering politics, gender, social issues uh, for various news outlets. Uh, Neha, thank you for joining us. Since thank September, you, Sarah. you've been physically stalked, right? And uh, you've uh, openly talked about it. You've gone to the police. You say the stalker knows your physical location, and so much so, just uh, a few weeks ago, on the 25th of January, someone even tried to break into your home. tell us about this uh, uh thank you sara uh i i just want to start by saying that i i'm saying this and i want to put this out there that i say this as a person of privilege somebody who stays in delhi and who writes in english and whenever i say something i i now feel when i put this information out i'm heard 
but the same thing is happening right now with a lot of journalists in in various cities and towns and they are not heard because of their caste class or geographical locations what happened with me is something that has been happening for the last six six and a half years that uh, each time one would do a story hmm. a story that is uh, investigative that that talks about the uh, uh, people who uh, uh, who are marginalized who are socially economically marginalized who are politically marginalized and if there is an uh, each time i've done an investigative story there has been a lot of trolling and that hmm. continues and this is not unique to me uh, as you said earlier but you're that- sure these threats uh, have to do with your a professional sphere your professional yeah, work it's absolutely. not personal infatuation yeah, yeah. etc any of those things yeah i was just coming to that so as as a as a journalist each time i put out an investigative story there is a lot of trolling in the past there have been instances when if i've done uh, an investigation on encounters police fake police encounters in up or if i've done stories around child trafficking by rss affiliated groups in the northeast there has been a lot of trolling there have been gang rape threats there have been death threats there have been detailed discussions on how i should be raped, raped whether it should be a steel rod whether it should be a rose bush with thorns uh, my residential address has been put out in citing stone pelting uh, my family pictures have been out and i'm saying this because it's it's unfortunate that <laughs> as a journalist one is doing this work and instead of talking about the report that is put out we mm. as journalists become the story they don't counter you with fact absolutely okay. and and it becomes a personal attack and uh, you know it, this is horrible it's a uh, very scary that you have to go through this i can imagine uh, and we know this is the tip of the iceberg i can imagine many parents telling young women who want to be journalists saying beta you know why do you even need to do this so what the goal of this whole exercise is what according to you do you think i mean it is to harass you to a point where it starts affecting your work Absolutely sir I I want to say that online whatever we see online definitely translates into uh, an offline uh, uh, it's a, it's a part of offline efforts to stop you from doing what you're mm. doing as a journalist mm. and I would say that a lot of of online threat abuse because it's an organized troll army it it is directed at us and that that same pressure is used for instance i can actually map out the kind of criminal cases that have been filed against me after i have done stories uh, investigative stories have been uh, lobbied uh, all this lobbying was done online similarly the kind of uh, threats that i just told you about that that have been happening since september i see that uh, earlier in the past my residential was put out and now the people who are stalking me and who call hmm. me up and say that you know you will be gang raped or we'll throw acid on you and we just know you know uh, what kind of reporting do you do or your we'll kill your partner we'll kill you we know we are standing outside buying sabzi and stuff like that so i can clearly see that there is a connection so uh and then finally to basically harass you so much that you stop doing yeah. those stories are you get so involved in following up with those police complaints and trying to protect yourself that to the point that self censorship sets in and you stop doing what you're doing so online violence now clearly the new frontier uh, front line for women journalists let's uh, bring in our other guest we have joining us from oxford in the uk we have dr julie pasetti she's a global director of research at the international center for journalists and also an author the author of protecting journalism sources in the digital age we have subuhi khan she's an advocate and social activist with a pro bjp leanings and we have apar gupta lawyer and executive director of the internet freedom foundation dr pasetti to you first the icfj has has been focusing on a global study into gendered online violence it's a study that's commissioned by the UN i think what are the findings of this study that uh, is it that women uh, marginalized and women basically non conforming women, women especially bear the brunt of online violence and what is the scale of this it's a huge problem and it's a global problem it's particularly a problem where online violence translates into offline attacks as we've just heard um very potently from your guests um so we have uh, according to a survey of 1000 uh journalists around the world 80% of whom were women we can deduce that 73% of the women who responded said they had experienced online violence which can be um anything from serious uh abuse through to threats of rape and sexual assault uh, and murder but also the sorts of digital attacks your guest was just talking about so where you end up with your uh, do- what's called doxing where your p- private information is spread on the internet as a way of trying to increase the risk that you'll be attacked offline now of our, our respondents 
20% uh, of the women journalists we surveyed said that they had experienced offline attacks that they believed had been seeded or started through online campaigns. Mm. And those campaigns are often orchestrated and they do frequently have connections to political powers. So it builds up. That's why especially it needs to be nipped in the bud. That's why we need to focus on what is being done to protect, uh, uh, to look at the serious problem, this crisis of uh, online harassment, of misogynistic attacks. But Claudia, you said it's a global problem. The scale is global. It's, uh, you see this across, uh, uh, Julie, Dr. Possetti, you see this across uh, countries globally. But, um, you know, Claudia Webb, the MP in the UK, the UK MP has just tweeted, she says, I've received trolling. Uh, death threats, rape threats, threats of sexual violence. Uh, uh, Claudia, mm. of course, is in the UK where you're from, from your accent. I, I think you're Australian, but you're That's in correct. the UK. So I'm asking you, this yes. is what Claudia has uh, tweeted. Um, mm. I have faced threats of sexual violence, misogyny, anti-black racism, outright lies, gaslighting, mm. false allegations, malicious reporting, smear campaigns, everything really. I stand for human rights. I stand with farmers. Mm. Hashtag farmers protest. So the scourge is global. It does yes. not discriminate. But has this week highlighted India as one of the centers for misogynistic online trolling against women, women with a voice, women with opinions? Yes, and I think public uh, figures, so women who are MPs, uh, women who are human rights defenders of all sorts, journalists, um, are particularly targeted because when we put our head up above the parapet, when we dare to speak, the misogynists come raining down. This is used, particularly this online violence um, that is gendered, is used to try and chill critical reporting and any kind of advocacy uh, for justice, for human rights, particularly when it comes to disinformation. So where these attacks intersect with disinformation is particularly uh, virulent. So the objective is to both chill critical reporting, to silence women, and to create disbelief uh, in, in what women have to say. So the, so the effect is twofold. It's chilling and it's silencing, but it's also misogynistic. Uh, and it causes women to withdraw into the shadows, which is a terrifying uh, reality. India is indeed in international headlines, not just this week uh, in reference to online violence. Um, we, we can link the attacks, for example, on the murdered uh, journalist Gauri Lankesh with, yeah, with online violence before she uh, was murdered. Um, there have been calls from a variety of UN actors to uh, support Rana Ayub, another Indian journalist, when she was uh, and continues to be brutally uh, attacked online with great uh, risks that this sort of attack can. So, uh, uh, Apar Gupta, then what can we do? Can the government uh, control this online misogyny, in the troll armies in India? C can it protect its women citizens? Does the Indian police have sufficient IT infrastructure? Do we have any laws for online misogyny harassment? Uh, there are certainly uh, enough legal provisions which are there under the Indian Penal Code, under the Information Technology Act, as well as uh, other legislations which can also be used. Hmm. But this goes beyond law. I think this speaks more towards enforcement. And it is the enforcement itself and the cultural attitudes which need a deeper change, Correct. especially when women are speaking out on issues of contemporary politics or they are voicing dissent. I would indicate that given that there's a high degree of political partisanship at present, all political leaders need to clearly signal not only to people who are aligned with them within these parties, but also to their supporters to maintain a high degree yeah. of civility online and in conversation. Accounts which engage in abuse should not be followed by public officials, especially high public officials. Yes. Union ministers or politicians should not make speeches and should be clearly called out when they question the legitimacy of women who make comments which are against their political interest this is and i'm situating this also with hate speech the offline online interaction is today complete with the number of people and the frequency with how much people access their smartphones just like in hate speech that prior to violence there is repeated hate speech made against a community hmm. which may be any community offline violence is the often the result today of online
delegitimization, yes. dehumanification of women and people from across the gender spectrum who are not heteronormative upper caste males. So and we in, in, need to actually approach this problem with social and cultural sensitivity, which comes from our political leadership. Sure, we need to do all of that. But also, what about the role of platforms then as vectors? Because yes, there is entrenched yes. patriarchy. Yes, they are being yes. emboldened by our political leadership. And but uh, there's a product of hostile, toxic online communities. But what about platforms? Is the platform also doing the enabling? I, I certainly do think so. Platforms do play a, a contributory role in this, even if unwittingly. Uh, they repeatedly put out assurances that they are building certain technical tools, they're deploying uh, automated filters, uh, but a lot of their actions actually are inconsistent and their allegations of hypocrisy and bias. Because quite often how they release content online and they make decisions as to what content stays hmm. up, which user accounts are suspended and which are permitted. Hmm. This decision making is opaque. It's not transparent by itself. And one does okay. not know why a certain accounts as well as tweets or Facebook messages or um, uh, any kind of posts are permitted and others are not. So I think that uh, platforms by themselves, given the scale of mm. resources they have today and they have so much money they have so many people they need to invest more towards ensuring that their primary goal should not only be retention of the users as to how much time they spend online but the quality of that correct. conversation correct all right uh, uh, subuhi khan joins us uh, subuhi you're a supporter of the bjp you've tweeted saying that uh, you believe that you know these are paid tweets all these international stars who have been speaking up uh, about the former standing with the farmers you say it's a huge conspiracy against bharat what they did with donald trump they're trying to do against our prime minister but i want to ask you as a woman uh, do you believe that uh, an argument can be made without slurs being used without character assassination Absolutely. You've asked a very beautiful question and I have always maintained this. See, I can oppose Congress as a party, but you know, when I try to put allegations on the, on the chief of Congress, like if we start fighting with Sonia Gandhi as a woman, circulating her pictures online and trolling and humiliating her as a woman, her, her old friendships or whatever, it is absolutely wrong. When we talk about Rehana, we should focus on the fact that she is friends with Jagmeet Singh, who's a Dem leader of Canada, pro-Khalistani, pro-Pakistani. We should not start slut slamming her, you know. And when uh, recently, like off late, we've seen during Shaheen Bagh, there was a woman called Safura Zargar, and she was charged under UAPA. And instead of talking about those serious charges, I saw the tweets, uh, you know, trolling her about her pregnancy, who she slept with, about her relationships. So that is absolutely wrong. But, we, uh, you know, as a part points out, many the... have pointed out, a lot of this, uh, uh, these trolls, nameless bots are emboldened by the political leadership. Absolutely. You See, I would like to mention, do not make exceptions rules. Like one woman here, she has mentioned about some right-winger organizations humiliating her or trolling her. Whoever is doing it, I absolutely no, no, but, condemn that person. But Ms. Khan, but, the, but please when you me, have the, the, you know, the tallest, I mean, the leader, the prime minister following some of these trolls, it's openly known. It doesn't it embolden them. But let's quickly try and get in some audience uh, views in here. They've all been waiting patiently. Thank you. Do we have Radhika Narayan Mathur of the Lady Shriram College? My alumni. So uh, yeah, go, help us. go ahead. Unmute Radhika. Uh, yeah. So on one hand, our government is promoting the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao Andolan that we all know about to prevent our gender-based sex selective elimination, to ensure survival, protection, education, and participation of the girl child. However, in reality, when the daughters of our country take a stand or express an opinion which is contrary or at variance with the go government's chosen ideologies or policies, they're charged for sedition, for you know promoting communal disharmony, for making statements prejudicial to national integration, there's, you know, some disproportionate censorship and the legal mm. framework, Section 69A of the IT Act, it puts immense discretionary powers in the hands of the central government, empowering it to act arbitrarily. What is your take on this absolute hypocrisy which is being displayed by the authorities? And don't you think it's high time that there's a need to amend this Section 69A, which, you know, is the root cause of the opaqueness and the lack of transparency? So who would you like to take? Uh, Apar, okay, let's try and bring in uh, uh, Parul Singh also joining us. Uh, Parul, what's your question? 
Thank you, ma'am. Uh, my question is very simple. We have, we all have seen that how the government has been so quick on reacting on social media posts which criticize the government. They have gone to the extent of blocking the accounts and terming mere criticism as sedition. They have imposed unreasonable charges. But why similar action? Like though I don't support this. But why is no action taken against uh, criminal elements who openly give rape and murder threats to women? Absolutely. No case has been lodged and like similarly. Different strokes for different folks. I, before we end, I want to first just touch upon one very important issue. Neha, perhaps, Neha Dikshit, could you answer this question in your opinion? Because as Ms. Chandi uh, points out, she says in her case, a lot of the trollers were women. Uh, Ms. Khan has complained of being trolled uh, herself if she raises uh, pro-BJP voices. Why do you think it is? I mean, is it just entrenched patriarchy? So It's so entrenched that we don't realize it's there. Why do you think that is? Uh, I would like to say, Sarah, yes, definitely it's patriarchy, and which is why in patriarchy both men and men, women can be patriarchal, and which is why uh, this kind of uh, abuse uh, comes our way each time we uh, express our opinion. But I would also like to say, and which has been mentioned in the past in this program, which is that in the last six and six, six and a half years, we have seen that the people who actually troll are emboldened. The person who put out my residential address is still followed by the official handle of Prime Minister Modi. And why why does it continue to happen? Because I, I filed a complaint in 2016 and it's 2021 now. Mm. So the fact that the, there is an atmosphere that you can do this, you can give these kind of threats and you can get away with it and there'll be no action. And which is why people continue to do it. So Absolutely. which is why the government needs to be held accountable. That how does this the continue? government does need to be held accountable. We're running out of time. Let me quickly get some more audience. Uh, uh, Shirsa Sen of Jindal College. Uh, hello, ma'am. Yes, I'm here. Uh, yes, so I had, I had this one pertinent question. While we've been seeing trolls happening for like the longest time historically as well, uh, what are some of the effective measures that we can take or why has these effective measures not been taken? If you could actually answer that, uh, effective measures vis-a-vis -vis legal remedies that could be taken to reduce online trolling. All right, all right. Apart, is there anything uh, uh, legally that one can do to reduce online trolling? Is there anything, uh, we could end on a show, if there's any one of uh, our viewers here, anyone watching, if they face this, what should they do? What can they do first? So, uh the Women and Child uh, Welfare uh, Ministry has made an online portal. It's supposed to coordinate with local police departments every time you file a complaint. But the actual prosecution is usually done by a cyber cell, usually in metropolitan cities across yeah. India. You file your complaint there. Uh, you may be facing right. several uh, 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 challenges when you file that complaint. Of course. Uh, and immediately your prime concern may be uh, twofold. Firstly, it is to take down the content which is circulating with regard to you. Hmm. And that can be achieved through this process. And secondly, it is also after you redact your personal information to put information that you have in fact filed a criminal complaint. Now, the police may register FIR. Hmm. It may bring the accused to book. But I think more women need to start putting out that they have started approaching the police departments yes. and telling their offenders, these nameless people who lack courage and any kind that of self-dignity. That you will not get away with it as Deha yes, Dikshit will, has done. Yes, yes, exactly. So please, And also to hold the police accountable. Yeah. To hold the officials exactly. accountable, to ask them what exactly. have they done, have they followed up on these complaints. But thank you all for joining us. We're completely out of time. But uh, thank you for joining us on We The People, where we believe it's important to speak up, but it's also important to listen. And we need to learn increasingly to do that more civilly. Thank you all for joining us on We The People tonight. Bye-bye.